So my topics, I'm an economic geographer by training, so they're a little bit less uh, straightforward income than what uh, Steve uh, told you about, but I try to be as much as an economist as I can pretend to be there. So you're a better one than most economists. <laughs> <laughs> so the first topic is the curse of machinery or the age old idea that uh, new technologies are destroying jobs and I'm sure in the end of work. The second is uh, eco oil or more generally uh, the idea of running out of resources. And the last is, uh, I don't know, a bit more original than as much as it's my own research, and I'm still trying to publish it in as many decent economic journals as I can. Meaning that the environmental externalities issue is, I believe, uh, grossly overestimated or overblown by economists, especially as it concerns the uh, manufacturing sector. Okay, so, uh, you know, it's one of these, the curse of machinery. Uh, this is John Kay. A fellow who's trying to hide from a mob of angry people here, I don't know what, these are not admirers, they're actually uh, there to get his head, and he's uh, trying to hide in a machine here. Now, he's not some employee of the government who's overtaxed the local serfs or peasants or people, he's not somebody who was a ruthless lord, and, you know, he was the prima doctrine or some vast rules or customs that might have made people angry. He was the inventor of something called the flying shovel. Now, we'll get into the details, but uh, the key advance that the flying shovel made possible is that it could produce more textile using less workers. And these are unhappy workers who think that John Key is ruining their livelihood. And so they're out there to get it. These are not Luddites. You might be familiar with the expression, because Luddites will only come around about 50 years later, during the Napoleonic War. If you've taken a course in, uh, I don't know, uh, one of those, uh, what, special department, let's say gender, women, or whatever studies, you might hear a lot of people who say, well, the Luddites were not really about smashing the machines, they were mostly about fighting for workers' rights, and asking for a decent wage and a fair share or a distribution of whatever wealth was created with those machines. Well, I've checked the historical record, and they were really about smashing machines more than about <laughs> business. That's the image you know, would convey. But of course, uh, the Luddites were there for a little while, and then they disappear. But this is a movement that comes back periodically. So uh, the fellow on the right here is not out of a bad science fiction movies from the 1970s, because this is actually a 1930s poster. So during the Great Depression in the United States, you have a group, rather influential, a group of people who said that, well, we're having a depression because the machines are destroying their jobs. And so you have a choice. Either you get capitalism run amok, which puts 30 million people out of work in 1933, or you put us like a private charge, we'll get rid of those pesky things like democracy and make sure that everybody gets its fair share of the wealth that is created. So a revolution without budget put the technocrats in charge and they will somehow uh, minimize the impact of those awful machines which have been destroying all this work and creating the Great Depression. <sighs> this is where you might need to end in this if you're ever into to this. So this is Jeremy Rifkin, my least favorite policy entrepreneur in the world. I don't know if you're with him. <laughs> Rifkin has been wrong with everything he wrote for the last 30 years. Well, he's been around since the 70s, really, so really the last 40 years. So he says, cities are about to disappear, our food is healing us, computers are destroying jobs, the European Union will overtake the United States. And still he's on TV again twice this year, and I can't even get there with my goddamn book. And <laughs> silly books, he gets on, he's on Alan Bragg, he's on Steve Bacon, and they're all, oh, Mr. Rifkin. I, I hate him. <laughs> This is where I began having an issue with my thesis advisors and my thesis advisor in the 1990s because, yeah, Rifkin prominently displayed the end of work on his, on his desk and they really wanted me to read that. And I was like, Bill, this is stupid. His name is Bill. And uh, so what I ended up doing, and this is just to tell you how great my department was in the University of Moya, I came up with a lecture to show why Jeremy Rifkin is wrong. And I was a teaching assistant in his course and in another professor's course. And they gave me a whole session, a whole lecture, to lecture on how Jeremy Rifkin is wrong about that. And this was my sort of first official formal lecture ever to uh, undergraduate students. Of course, they got three hours free out of this, but still, uh, I was happy that they would let me uh, try to debunk Rifkin. 
So this is an issue of which I've actually been uh, lecturing for something like uh, 15 years now. So anyway, uh, from uh, the Luddites to Jeremy Rifkin, how is there now that you know, more jobs were created than were destroyed by new technology? So these are just some numbers uh, from the US, but I mean, the threat is general overall. So what is? Well, obviously, the economists have explained that for a very long time. I mean, we've had a perfectly good answer for around two centuries, at least, which has always been vindicated over time, but somehow never really makes it to uh, the public discourse. This seems to be a bit too difficult for other drivers to think and to wrap their hands around. So, in short, here I will refer to Henry Aslett, who provides as good a summary of the argument as anybody I'm aware of. So, in economics in one lesson, published in 1948, in which he actually does refer to the technocrats in his footnotes, if you want to remember how to check the Aslan's footnotes. Uh, he basically raises the basic cotton ground. So if technology is destroying jobs, most, the most prosperous people should have been the least creative. So you know, these guys here were just uh, putting fire out and destroying the wheel or really doing the money to you know, They were by far pushing things as far. These people have the right ideas. And the reality is that, of course, the more, the more labor saving machinery or jobs or technologies you have, the more prosperous your economies are. And people typically move from countries where you don't have a lot of labor saving technologies to countries which have a lot of them. And they do that in order to find jobs. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So imagine, for example, that uh, you're an evil capitalist who produces gold and sells gold for a living. And somebody someday comes to you, maybe an inventor or something, or a salesperson for a large manufacturing concern that manufactures these uh, machine, these uh, machines to produce gold and says, well, I've got a new production technology that will reduce your labor cost by 50%. And so you're a greedy capitalist and you say to yourself, well, you know, I can fire 50% of my workers. Yay. And you, but you know, if you're a worker, you might not be so happy. So you could say, if you take a standard TV Ontario perspective, that oh my god, 50% of the workers are fired. Yes, a few people will be hired to build and maintain those machines, but obviously this will never be enough, right, to make up for the discrepancy. But then this is where you need to really focus on the evil capitalist first and assume that he behaves like any evil capitalist. So, after the machine has produced economic sufficient to offset its cost, because obviously you have enough money cost to pay for it, it would seem that the manufacturer is making more money than before and not job for the loss of the process, which are perfectly valid assumptions. But obviously this is not the end of it. I mean, this is a fairly sophisticated audience, and you're, you're used to thinking beyond what is immediately visible, but this is where, again, a lot of journalists struggle. So the extra profits must be used in out of three ways, unless you assume that, uh, for example, the US dollar will be so devalued that it won't make more sense at one point to do like in Weimar, Germany, and plaster it on your wall because it's cheaper than wallpaper or burn it in your oven or something. So you either expand operations, you invest it elsewhere, or you increase consumption. Whatever you do with your uh, newfound wealth as a capitalist, you will create employment in some ways. And if you live in a market which is reasonably competitive, unless you've been given a monopoly by the government, you are competitive, or at least as smart as you. And because of that, well, they will also use these new machines, fire workers, but because they're not able to produce more using less inputs, they can make a profit by lowering their prices, which is what they do. So because of 
consumers have more money to spend. We live in a world where we have more things to buy and things are more diversified over time. And we create many new jobs that did not exist before in the process. So he says, wow, this is how the magic of the market works. The new labor saving technologies end up creating more jobs than they destroy. And obviously, more people are made better off by labor, by labor saving technologies. The key issue is always that displaced workers must find new employment. And again, as he was saying, if you're trained in underwater basket weaving, he said, I think, mm -hmm. you might have a problem. Although I don't know if you are. You might always get a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. <laughs> Yeah. 
serious reason again, the world outside line will look like a bell shaped exhaustion curve, which we just saw. But obviously, the peak oil curve is the sum of all individual worlds. So you would have a new curve here for a region, half of the oil is produced, and increasing new oil will have less accessible deposits, uh, which will be um, tapped into the environment of stuff. Okay, uh, why should we believe any of that? Well, because people are going to tell you Albert was right. In 1956, he correctly predicted that in the United States, uh, the United States oil production supply would essentially peak around the 1970s. So this was one model put down by others. I'll get back to this one here. And the observed uh, results, according to the uh, US Energy Information Agency, was, resulted in a peak which was about at the same as what the Earth had predicted. And so with the credibility that the Earth gives them, the boilers are not about to. Historical time. We have a brand new 
use up to 40% of our oil supplies, and so it's up to the default scenario. We need, for, we need a countrywide drift campaign to save this essential resource. Uh, other quotes from a U.S. Geological Survey, which, uh, you know, they seem to be about as good as economists in terms of forecasting the future, so we see. So the U.S. oil supply will last 26 years in 1909. The U.S. oil supply will last 20 years in 1922. The oil left for only 13 years in 1939. And oil left for only 13 years in 1951. At some point, you know, people begin to scratch their head and say, well, you know, what you guys are better shame for yourself or something. And, of course, the typical answer was always that, well, it is unsafe to rest in the assurance that plenty of petroleum will be found in the future, merely because it has been in the past. So that's a 1936 quote, but you still hear plenty of similar quotes today. Okay, fast forwards. Uh, my second most despised person in the world of the German Rifkin is actually Maury Lovins. I don't know if you've ever read of his stuff. Just, you know, you can be around for 40 years and still have a wonderful career if you will say what people want to hear. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Uh, so Mr. Levin has been wrong about everything, and for years he's been trying to develop uh, cars and that are much more ecological than uh, those that are put out by the big trees. And he says, well, look at my anchor car. It's so much tighter, it burns almost nothing. And then he said, well, how do you really do that? Well, I use the most sophisticated carbon material that is used on airplane. And so my anchor car costs something like $200,000. Thank you very much. <laughs> you can achieve things, a lot of things if you don't factor in trade offs. So, Levin's 1975. Prominent exploration experts tell us that the total world production of liquid oil will peak at the end of this decade and will decline thereafter. So, we're not talking about the US peak here, but the world peak. So, the phase is a perfectly singular character at Princeton. It's actually a creative guy, and as much as apparently he yeah, has the one of my colleagues is a former student of his, and he made his money by actually founding, uh, finding a way to uh, recover wealth out of mine failings. But uh, what, he, what he's famous for is that when he was at Princeton, I don't think he's there anymore, he used to have this thing on his car, unfeed trash and proud of it, because he came from Western Texas or Oklahoma, and he would have around Princeton with that thing. But he was really a uh, big bother. So the phase died in 2005, a handful of petroleum geologists, including me, have been predicting peak oil before 2007. And actually came up with an accident, an accident. It was like, I don't know, November 13, 2005 or something, and nobody figured out why it was using that specific date. But you can see now with the end. So all, but the, the interesting thing is that, apart from Hubbard, all prominent peak oilers are on the record as having been proven wrong. They've been at this for several decades. They've all predicted past years. Now, what's interesting is that even Albert was wrong. If you actually go back to the original writings, his peak prediction does not come from his 1956 writing, but from some from later 1960s writing, and it was one scenario that he had. So he was sort of right on the US peak, but other factors were at play uh, there. What happened in the early 1970s is that uh, two things really came along. Uh, the super tanker, which brought oil and petroleum uh, from other locations more cheaply than could be produced in the United States. And a lot of areas in the United States were put off limit for oil exploration. So we got the timing right, but only sort of. But then he was wrong three other times. He was wrong on the US national gas peak, he was wrong on the US international oil peak, and he was wrong on the international natural, natural gas peak. So the way I usually present that is think of it, you know, if he was a baseball player, it's not even that he would be batting for 250, but rather that he got on the first base because he got hit by the pitcher. That's really, you know, is that, if that's the most credible expert you have on this issue, is that really what you want to, you know, what's your credibility on? And other problems with Albert, well, as you saw in that previous graph, the peak was 18% of all his prediction. So a lot more oil was actually produced in the United States than he had said. And as I'll show you in a few seconds, the decline curve doesn't really look like a perfect symmetrical value. Uh, the decline has been much less anticipated because more offshore deposits were found in Alaska came along, which he had not anticipated. And as I was telling you, the US, the US timing was right in this case, but mostly because of super tankers, which were not from other locations, and there was internal regulations. So this is what the US peak actually looks like. So this is the early 1970s. But if you see the red curve here, 
doesn't quite really look like uh, normal distribution. That's another way to look at it. So this is the 1970s. And in fact, more recently, it could actually be going up because of our share of oil in uh, our metals and other places. And the no zone in the United States will see. I mean, uh, what Obama did is that you know, on top of what already existed, they've put a lot of uh, natural uh, public land inside the U.S. further off than in the past. So if you are if you are in the U.S. So production business, you're pretty much limited to the western Gulf of Mexico outside of uh, over 48 location and the known slope uh, in Alaska. Okay, so why have Hubbard and all the other deflationists been so wrong and for so long? Well, basically because they don't really uh, understand the basic human creativity process that I have been telling you about. So, of course, if you assume that the Earth's natural resources are finite, and for some reason, and they obviously are able to live on a spheric ball of stuff, and it's not expanding, uh, it is true that if you use the same thing continuously in the same way, that things will eventually be exhausted. And yet, you look at the data, and even non-renewable resources are increasing year after year. So these are the coal reserves of uh, the United States. So in the 1950, you had this amount here. Then 75% of that was used in production between 50 and, 50 and 2002. And yet, the amount of recoverable coal was multiplied by four. Uh, natural gas, and again, uh, this is not factoring in shale gas here, the reserve 1950. 1966, twice that amount was burned between 67 and 2003, and yet the amount of natural gas available in 2003, again before shale gas came along, was six times higher. Uh, but yes, yeah, so this is the data that is missing. The shale gas revolution came along, and as you can see, the amount of natural gas available in the United States has really gone up dramatically. Uh, crude oil, so 1944 reserves, 18 times more that the reserves available in 1944 were burned in the process, and yet in 2003, 25 times more oil reserves, petroleum reserves were available. So again, what gives? Well, there's more audience, I'm sure you know the answer. The first is that humans are not like other animals. We don't just consume resources, we create resources. So the traditional quotes that Julian Simon and other people was fond of using was from Henry George, an American economist in the 19th century. Both the geoc and the man eat chickens, but the more geocs the fewer chickens, while the more men the more chickens. We can expand and create the resources that we use. We just don't pick up, we just don't live on what nature gives us. Oops. That's the like the center button, like I said. So just You know what the man three boxes? 
speak for old fashioned ways. <laughs> Uh, was the frying oil that was used in the cafeteria. <laughs> Amazing. You go there and you don't 
smell it. I've seen much worse manufacturing plants than uh, some of the operations in the oil sands. And the interesting development is that now good energy analysts are telling you that, you know what, the Americas will actually overtake the Middle East in the very short run in terms of total energy production because of the shale gas revolution. I won't get into the details of uh, what the advances were. Uh, shale rocks or then Places, recovery from old wells. So when oil wells are capped, uh, there's always a lot of stuff left in there. We just don't know how to go get it, but when technologies are developed, you can always go get a little bit more. Additional oil from the Gulf of Mexico, heavy oil uh, might come along, we don't know. Uh, Brazil, they found some uh, pre salt and deep water resources. This probably means that uh, the price of sugar will go down eventually because it will be smart enough to give up on ethanol, unlike the US, at least. That's my hunch. And Canada, of course, uh, as long as the oil prices remain above $80, so we can produce oil profitably for a few centuries with present technology. And so if everything goes to hell in the Middle East, at least we're not going to run out of oil anytime soon, and so the oil doesn't make sense. Okay, fair enough. My last one, I'll try to keep it done. So, profits and environmental externalities. So, again, this is more about the work than stuff. Summarize from other people. So, a conventional view, if you talk to uh, some of my colleagues, kill capitalism before it kills the planet. So, this is from the Earth Liberation Front, but they blame in that case uh, slash and burn agricultural capitalism, which I don't quite understand, but something else. So, the idea, of course, is that if you get capitalism on a market, People will only care about their pocket and they will not care about uh, ruining the environment. So this is actually an early 20th century drawing of what the artists imagined the uh, early industrial revolution to have looked like. Oh, well, since I was talking about energy, do you know what these things are here? Anybody know? Okay, so you might take natural gas for granted to be, but actually it was not historically. So people were actually manufacturing gas. Essentially what they were doing was co uh, cooking coal and getting gas out of it. Which they would keep in those, these are kind of big balloons, which are sort of inflated with gas, and then the gas would be distributed to uh, nearby industries. And then obviously natural gas became uh, something that you were trying to avoid because it could blow up your own burning operation, but people were able to capture it and it turned out to be a better uh, alternative than manufacturing this. Anyway, to get back to the subject at hand, profits here will result in a short-term outlook, benefits only a minority, and capitalists will always cut quarters because if you're able to pollute, you're able to reduce your production costs. Because if you care about the environment, then you've got to put a scrubber on your smokestack or develop technologies that are expensive and that don't add anything to your bottom line. They don't pay a cost, they don't bring any benefits. And so this is why you need the visible end of government to make sure that the invisible, that the invisible end has something of a green thumb. But there are some inconvenient facts here. So there's the sort of basic theory. You don't make any money, uh, not polluting, so why would you do it if the government doesn't force you? And then you look at the data and you realize that, you know, the air that we breathe is cleaner, our waters are cleaner, forests are making a comeback. So one part of the explanation, I don't pretend that this is all of it, but it is simply that the invisible end doesn't need a green thumb. And the question you've got to ask yourself is, okay, why would greedy business people dump potential resources in the earth and run over water? Which is essentially what capitalists would be doing. Because again, the stuff that goes out of your operation in the form of pollution is stuff that you paid for in the first place. Okay, nobody gives you resources for free, so if you lose some of it by releasing it in the environment, you're essentially wasting money. And the short answer is that it's not really needed. It's not being already about the quote, right? I like this quotation so much that I use it all the time, even though that this is where I usually lose a part of my audience. Uh, anyway, so quote, so 2007 quote, if your goal is to lose weight, which obviously I could 
better to focus on having a naked voice. This is how we create value. This is how we achieve better results. And so we keep proposition that I put forward in my work without realizing that somebody else had formulated it better than I did it before. This fellow here, Bernstein, who was a Soviet economist, who observed that, well, it's funny, you look at the Soviet Union, let's say 1985 in the United States, and the United States are like three or four times wealthier per capita if you look official statistics and probably more than that in reality. And yet, their environment is notably cleaner than the much poorer Soviet Union. And so his answer is that a clean environment is actually not a function of how much stuff you produce and how much stuff you consume, but rather of how wasteful you are and how you produce and consume. So if you are wasteful in producing stuff, then more stuff will come out of this whole stuff. If you're wasteful in the way you can some stuff, then more stuff will, stuff will find its way in the environment. And so he said it's not wealth per se, or production per se, that affects environmental quality, but all this stuff is not. And so what you see in advanced economies, advanced capitalist economies, is that people have become a little more efficient over time, whereas in the Soviet Union, they became less efficient. This is really what explains the discrepancy between, let's say, uh, Russia or a large city in Russia in 19, uh, let's say, 16 or something before the communists came along, and several decades down the road. So between 1977 and 2000, and these are statistics that I took from Al Gore, so I'm questioning me on them, the value of the US economy was multiplied by two and the population increased by 55 million, but yet the weight loss of the American economy was uh, not negligible. So a lot more wealth was created, and at the same time, less stuff was used in the American economy in terms of its absolute physical quality and weight. Now, I still was thought of comparing a smartphone and a laptop before, but obviously you can compare a laptop <coughs> to an electronic variable integrator and computer in India, which was basically the first functional computer that people had, at least the first one that was vacuum tube. And so, this is what the first thing that looked like, so it would have looked quite a little bigger than this one. Uh, over, it weighed over 30 tons, over 20 kilowatts of electrical power, and roughly 18,000 vacuum tubes. And with all of that power, you could basically do long divisions. <laughs> and obviously today you can do the stuff that the million in the maniacs could not have done with a simple data. And look at the decrease in weight. Now, this is obviously a dramatic example of the shows a trend that you can observe in all segments of the market economy. So if you look at the evolution of steamships in the 19th century, you move people around, you move a lot more stuff and a lot better using a lot less coal at the end of the 19th century than at the beginning of it. Uh, the same for locomotives. Uh, Steve and I are old enough to remember a time when we were teenagers where, you know, uh, crunching a uh, can of something on the forehead was actually a feat to be admired. I don't know if that, if that lasts, I've seen all the hearings. And my I tried once, of course, I was never good at these things, so I couldn't do it properly. But, you know, today it's, you can basically push it very easily. And that's because the weight in aluminum uh, has gone down dramatically. Yeah. Nobody has a can of aluminum. If you've never really looked at a silver can, it's kind of wonderful because you've got to ask yourself, well, why is it that it has a sort of a curvature that it does at the bottom? Why is it shape the way it is at the top. And these are all things that you take for granted, but that require a lot of tinkering to actually reduce the amount of aluminum that was used in an average aluminum can. And so it's actually a fairly sophisticated design you never think of because it's so ubiquitous. But look at it carefully and ask yourselves why it has the shape that it has. And it was all to reduce the amount of aluminum needed to use a certain, uh, to contain a certain amount of uh, carbonified liquid. Uh, the average car since the 1970s, so the weight has gone down 25%, food can 50% lighter than 50 years ago, and when you substitute that, uh, when you replace that with a flexible plastic pouch, and the weight goes down 93%, plastic soda bottles are 30% lighter than the 1970s. I mean, I still remember, I'm sure you time when we used to have big glass bottles. When did it disappear? Like 20 years ago? Maybe 1980, something like yeah. So, uh, a lot of people have given me on that, including Karl Marx, of all people. And Marx said, well, there are two ways to really achieve economies. There are two ways to create economies and market economies. The first is to scale up production. But he says the second big source is in the condition of production themselves, 
the reconversion of waste into new elements of production, either of the same or other lines of industry, by throwing back the so-called expression into the cycle of production. And some historical case studies here very quickly, so I was telling you about coal gas before. Essentially, this is what people would do. You would ground the coal, you would eat it, you would add some steam to it, and you would have some nasty byproduct as a result, something called coal tar here in the process. Uh, some dirty water and the gas would come out of it. But the gas at first was problematic. So it was used for street lightings because there were a lot of mornings in London and having light if anything else could have to reduce the amount of money. And some people were willing to use better uh, uh, dirty gas in an outside complex. But then people tried to pipe it into homes and that's where I first had some problems. So as the Scottish famous line Playfair observed a few decades later, uh, at first in the beginning, so the gas would have an intolerable still water, it would be noxious when burned, it would discolor curtains, it would tarnish metals, it would eat through the covers of cook, and it would cover everything with its food and smoke. So not exactly a great product to buy in a few houses. But that's because there were nasty things like sulfur and other you know, things in it. And it actually people found ways to scrub the bad stuff out of it, and the gas became acceptable for home lighting. And all these byproducts were converted into useful stuff. And coal tar, which, you know, when people would throw it in the river for sure, it would get played because it would kill all the fish. You would bury it in the ground, it would destroy all the vegetation around, you would try to burn it, it would make a smoke that would poison the whole neighborhood. So people really didn't know what to do with it for a generation. And later it became the building block of our modern uh, synthetic world. I won't get into the details, but. Uh, People were willing to take all the coal tar that coal gas manufacturers would come up with because they had found hundreds of uses for it. Uh, so yeah, this is an advertisement from the uh, 1920s, I believe, so very sophisticated operation to recover everything that is used in the process. Uh, but really, on at first, the only thing, that, the only fraction that people were really interested in was uh, kerosene to replace uh, whale oil. Everything else would simply be uh, the bitumen, which was used for roofing and a few other uses, was basically thrown away. But then at one point somebody came up with something called uh, the internal combustion engine, and suddenly gasoline went, the went from being a dangerous and volatile waste product into something that was actually more valuable than the kerosene. So nothing was in the process. Slime, which is a matter of separated for the green production and the metal on its own. Uh, this is not the moon, this is actually the black country in England, which got its nickname because it was covered with slag at the time. People didn't know what to do with it. That's six million tons annually uh, that were actually produced uh, in England. And the cost of production in the steel industry at the time was roughly half of it to produce the stuff and almost half of it to get rid of the slag. And so people began scratching their heads and began thinking about other uses for it. So by 1881, they created building blocks out of it, building sand, cement of quality glass, uh, you know, again, sorry, Steve, if I keep picking up the all of them. But you know, we have those very disgusting little uh, brown beer bottles that we have in here. Uh, low quality glass often came from slag operations, or at least recovering slag. Mineral wool, so it was actually made from slag originally, and later fertilizers. And what really greenified the black country in England before we realized, oh, well, we can make asphalt out of it. So let's make road in it. We have cars now. And so we took care of the slack problem. And you made sure that the uh, road transportation was actually much better than it used to be. Uh, I'm sure we have a few of those in this time, although I think Kingston has on average more natural stone than in other places. But if you go in many places in Europe or Montreal, a lot of stone is actually not real. It was manufactured from slime. Uh, cotton seeds. So uh, the first environmental regulations in the United States uh, actually dealt with cotton seed, which just the name implies is the stuff inside cotton. Um, because in the 1820s and 1830s, it would just pile up in the south and it would attract vermin. You had that coastal river, it would actually kill some wildlife. So for a generation, that fellow tells us two thirds of the weight of cotton as it is picked was a nuisance, that it is a source of valuable byproducts. So again, the lint, the stuff around was valuable in cotton. They were left with all this cotton uh, seed stuff here. And by 1927, he came up with all sorts of productive uses for it. Uh, ivory soap, often done by uh, students now, because 
But today is more. <laughs> but today is mostly Malayalam and Malayalam, so we try to learn about this. But again, an industry was done in 1911, so common seed allows us to produce edible oil without olives, medicinal oil without cuttlefish, butter without cow's ice cream, without cream, without cream, without cream, without cream, without cream without blood, without eggs, fertilizers without blood, viruses without hair, and people were still making viruses with hair in the late 19th century. Stock feed without corn or oats, so uh, a lot of livestock was actually fat, and you put seed, common seed cake, and so on. And explosives without color. So, the world's richest seed, so from the real nuisance, the source of the first environmental regulations in the United States, have become the source of an unknown world in the early 20th century. So, a shiny roof glass and a little finish, and all the riches, what that is. So, the general picture that I like to show a lot is fellow Victor Shelford, University of Illinois, one of the most prominent. Um, we were biologists in America at the time, so it comes up with a graph of showing in a form of the treat the various ways of the useful substances in which we may be manufactured or which we be obtained from them. So, you know, uh, mine waste, munition waste, brewer waste, sugar waste, spa manufacturers, wood and paper waste, sewage proper, petroleum, coal and gas waste, gas waste, and again, all these sources of pollution were turned into profitable byproducts. Decades and decades and decades before the environmental protection agency came in. And this is the bad stuff when uh, the, th the bad things that happened when you did not take care of that. So people who believe that people had no environmental conscience in the past, well, no, they weren't aware of that and they were sort of trying to deal with those problems creatively. So, assuming that the economists blow this externality issue out of proportion because it's just a matter of looking at the movie rather than a particular image. Problems that could be solved by creative people. Assuming that I'm not completely wrong about that, what should policymakers do? Uh, trust people with creativity. So, another example which I like to use 75% of the 1.5 million of free condoms distributed each year in India end up being used as water for waterproofing roofs, <laughs> roads, polishing gold and silver for salaries, lubricating looms, disposable waste containers for workers to clean themselves in the uh, protecting guns and tanks, barrels against dust, and a lot of soldiers and vendors. Uh, not too far from the uh, Pakistani border, there's a big desert there, there's a lot of sand, so cover everything you can on your tank with condoms. Completely useful life. And all sorts of other uses. You know. So, <laughs> there's no way that central planners can even have more than a little bit of the creativity that is spread among people. Don't assume that you know better. Dealing with the problems, we'll typically come up with the solutions because they see what their problems are. And the more stuff there is around them, the more they're likely to combine it in a new way or find new applications for existing knowledge. So the key issues in that context let prices come in for regions, scrap subsidies. Make sure that the institutions that you have channel the self interest towards the common good and remove barriers and disincentive to normal business behavior. So the point I always make when I have this American audiences, like for Canada, we're a bit more sensible. In the US, if you produce something as 